Can you all hear me? Yeah, that's good. Oh. Right, you hear me before. Yeah, no. I've, got loud, I've got a loud voice. Um, now, Heritage Lottery Fund. I presume you've all heard of the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, making it simpler, access, archive and archaeology. It's a double act. Um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes. And because I'm the chair, and if we overrun, then I'll apologise. But actually, we've got, we've got enough time. And Aretha's going to take over when I leave off, and she says she can speak for eight minutes. So we may be ahead of ourselves. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know you can talk for longer, but you say we take eight minutes. Um, now, why did I call it Making It Simpler Access Archive and Archaeology? A couple of reasons. Uh, let's see what the next one is. Let's just keep it on that for the moment. Many of you may know that the Heritage Lottery Fund in July launched its strategic framework. Now, <clears throat> there's been lottery funding since 1994. The first grants were made in 1995, and we've had several strategic plans. This year, we decided to call it Strategic Framework because we're a UK-wide funder, and we need the, the, the F word, the flexible word, is the key one. Because although we need to have consistency right across the country in what we do, and by country, I mean the United Kingdom, and that's the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And if you don't mention Northern Ireland, anybody from Northern Ireland rightly gets upset. So that's what the United Kingdom stands for. Um, however, as elections happen, and especially the devolution uh, vote in Scotland, there are different ways in which projects might be delivered in different parts of the country. So that's why we call it strategic framework. One of the key messages in the strategic framework was to make what we do at the Heritage Lottery Fund simpler. Now, there's a huge difference between making it easy and making it simple. Making it easy would just be to have a, an ATM on the wall where you could all come with a card and take the money out and say this is for the heritage. That would be easy. Um, making it simpler means we're going to have uh, fewer rules, much easier access, I have used the easy word, to smaller grants to help smaller organisations. But we also realised one of the changes we had to make was to our uh, digital policy in the sense that it used to be the case that if there was only a digital output, you couldn't get heritage lottery funding. As of the 1st of July, we now say, uh, in terms of using the term digital output, it covers anything created in an HLF project in a digital format which is designed to give access to heritage and or help people engage, engage with and learn about heritage. For example, a collection of digital images or sound files, an online heritage resource, an exhibition or a smartphone app, etc. etc. And what I'm going to do is just a couple of uh, things around that and then Arik is going to go into more detail as to what it means and how, it, how you might benefit or how others might benefit by you knowing what we're doing. Um, HLF and digital policy, what's changed? Uh, in many ways, not a lot's changed because all projects we fund have to meet our criteria. So you might think, well, why have we changed the policy? Uh, the reason we've changed the policy is that, it, as I said in the past, if it was just a digital output, it would be kept. It now does. What we're moving towards in terms of the new strategic framework, and this isn't the place to go into it, but if you want to see more, go to the website. It's all on the website in immense detail. Um, the whole of the strategic framework is on there, so you can read the whole document. It doesn't take you very long. But the three words I've got up there, excuse me, heritage, people, and communities, all the projects are now assessed, or will be assessed, from whatever level, that's £3,000 right up to above £5 million on the outcomes, and that's the word we're using, for the heritage, whatever that heritage might be. So it could be a collection of old photographs, for example. It could be all the testimonies. Um, people, how will individuals benefit by this project, and then communities. And all three, depending on various levels as you go through the different uh, size of project application, all those three aspects will be assessed, or projects will be assessed against the outcomes for those three areas. Uh, I won't go into that anymore, but bear that in mind if you're thinking about digital projects. Now, not surprisingly, as I've already declared my interest in things aerial and things archaeological, there's a few aerial photographs. This photograph is the oldest photograph 
in the Aerofilms collection. Now, Aerofilms were the first commercial air photographic company, and they started taking photographs in 1919. And they continued taking photographs until 2006. And the image shows uh, Francis Wills carrying a camera. Now, I'm not sure which of the cameras. One's a cine camera and one's a still camera. Um, it's actually quite hard to tell which is which. So one of those is, is, is Francis Wills. The other is the pilot, Jerry Shaw. That's the guy in the middle. And the other is Claude Fries Green, who was a very well-known uh, pioneer of all things for photographic. And I think he did the first ever moving color images anywhere. Now, the reason for, for just showing Aerofilms is that this was a digital project, essentially a digital project, before we changed the policy. So technically, we shouldn't have funded it because it didn't meet our policy, but trustees loved it. And they said, this is brilliant because it's completely digital. And the reason it's important and useful, and I've just got a couple of other images, is that it has some fantastic aerial photographs right across Britain and actually uh, other parts of the world, but we're only focusing on Britain. It's a project that's being done by English Heritage, the Royal Commission on Ancient Historical Monuments in Scotland and the Royal Commission in Wales. And the project will conserve, digitise and catalogue this part of the collection. It's all the glass plates up to 1953, which once they're gone, they're gone. And the, the, re the reason our trustees loved it was that it showed how the landscape could change. But the really key point is, people will go, if you want to go on the website, did I... Uh, that's the website there, but from above. Uh, there's also a Twitter account. Is that as they start to digitize the, digitize the images, and I was talking to Kate Whitaker, who runs it the other day, uh, based in Swindon, they'll put up an image and they say, We have no idea where this is. And it's one of tens of thousands of images, but somebody out there knows where it is. And often, within minutes, somebody says, Oh, I know where that is. It's in the little uh, village where I live in Somerset or Devon or Scotland or Wales or whatever else. So it's, it's actually being able to catalogue this by using all those people who have nothing better to do than go on the website. And I hope you're going to be amongst those people who are on that website. So that's the kind of thing we're looking for. Um, I've just got, the, I put this image up and then also mention, uh, well, I'll come to that in a minute, what's the, the, the website at the bottom there. Um, so the, the Britain from Above is a large activity project based on web, uh, web access. As Aretha's going to tell you, the key thing is to identify your audience. And they did that brilliantly in that project. Uh, what's unusual about it in many ways is that it, it is a conservation project. And so it does both things. It gives the greater access, but it's also conserving a, huge, uh, a hugely important resource. Now, not all digital projects will do it. And you don't get extra branding points for doing it but there's no harm in actually putting that in. Uh, the reason I've put that on the bottom was just to remind you that when I wear another hat, which is Aerial Archaeology in Jordan, we've also put all our photography on, on the web, 66,000 images of all the aerial photographs of Jordan. Um, and although it's not yet linked with the archaeological databases, because my title was about archaeology as well, one of the things we're trying to do is to get the Jordanian authorities to fund somebody to actually link all the various bits of information that we've already created. Because the reason it's important, both in Britain, Europe, and the Middle East, in fact, right across the world, is that archaeology is being trashed every day we speak. I get emails probably once a week now saying, do you know they're putting a bypass here in a particular place in Jordan? which will go through some of the most sensitive prehistoric remains anywhere in the world, let alone in Jordan. So it is very important that we get access to this. And the other thing I wanted to say was that, and the reason that I put access and archives in, the, in my title, is that the work that I've done both in my sort of working life uh, as, as an inspector for English Heritage and also for the Heritage Lottery Fund, but also as somebody doing aerial archaeology, there's more information in existing archives than we will ever be able to actually analyze and understand. So actually unlocking those, and the best way to unlock them is through a digital resource. Uh, if, we never took, if we never did another excavation, never did another survey, never, never did any more aerial photography, there is enough information in, in existing archives, I think, to keep everybody in this room and hundreds more in jobs for the next 100 years. 
That's how important it is to get access to wine. And I just put that slide in because when Katie was, I said, can I have a couple of whizzy pictures? Um, <coughs> she said, this one was totally legal. Because in those days, they didn't have telephoto lenses. Whoever took that photograph was flying very, very low over a very important building, which you may recognize, not too far from here. I was hoping she would send one that was of somewhere that you wouldn't recognize. <coughs> but unfortunately, she didn't. Now, that's what I wanted to say. I'm going to hand straight over to Aretha, who's going to talk about digital engagement and participation and learning. I need to mind. You need to uh, Let me give you the mind. That's going to eat into my eight minutes. Don't worry, you, we've got plenty of time. <laughs> and anyway, I'm chairing. All right, perfect. <laughs> okay. All right, so as Bob's outlined, um, our new strategic framework does require applicants to really think about the difference that their project will make for heritage and people. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes just talking about how our projects achieve those outcomes for people and communities through digital engagement. So I won't go into this too much. I know you have a lot of examples later on this morning about here and how projects have engaged their audience as well. But from a HLF perspective, there are lots of reasons for developing digital um, activities to help organisations meet their goals for engaging people. And it can be useful to think about what you want to achieve from the outset, and you should be thinking about what you want to achieve from the outset. So for example, organisations may want to extend or enhance an on-site experience, highlight new stories and different perspectives, encourage people to record and share their own heritage. And as well as opening up a wealth of opportunities for this heritage area to share, and to continue sharing learning of what can be seen as a specialist area or not, not for the likes of me to some audiences. Okay. So, to achieve outcomes for a digital activity, applicants must cover the following. Firstly, they have to put the audience first. So that's identifying a target audience um, based on the needs and interests and demonstrate how people benefit from engaging through digital technology. They need to provide opportunities for people to do something active. This must involve more than just reading and receiving information. So for example, give audiences the opportunity to respond to the heritage context that Bob's example was earlier, to interact with other people and places, or to add to a wider knowledge of heritage. And they must enable people to deepen their understanding and awareness of heritage. For example, help people to discover new stories, sites, objects, to explore the heritage of interest to them, and or to share their own experience, memories, or learning with other people. So I'm just going to say a little bit more about those principles. Okay, so as with any Heritage Lottery Fund project, applicants need to determine who their target audience is. And once they know which audiences they want to target, they need to find out more about how they currently use digital technology. It all sounds very obvious. People are more or less likely to use or have access to different types of technology, depending on factors such as their age, whether or not they are in work, and their income. Older people and people from disadvantaged households are less likely to have access to the internet, for example. And different demographics are drawn to different types of technology, and different types of mobile phones, and social media is usually concentrated among young adults. So the question needs to be asked about whether digital is actually right for them, so not doing digital activity for the sake of it. And if it is right, what are they likely to use? If they do not have access to the internet, then online activity clearly is not going to engage them. And even if they are highly interested, they are more likely to use some technology over others. So for example, it makes no sense creating an iPhone app that everyone wants to do if your key audience is teenagers who predominantly use Blackberries because they're free. Uh, you need to think about who might be excluded by the technology. So can activity 
be provided on a variety of platforms to increase the potential audience. Sometimes a small <coughs> proportion of the population has certain types of digital technology, going back to that mobile phone usage. And like in any other project, the best way to find out more about people's needs and interests is to actually go out and talk to them and conduct some sort of audience research and consultation. And this can be done digitally, by example, through feedback from virtual focus groups and online networks such as Twitter or Facebook. Last year, we asked the image makers, which are a group of consultants, to help inform our knowledge of digital engagement, given that we were about to change this policy. And they produced some case studies based on examples of digital participation and learning across sectors and across the globe, really, which is in this publication, which is available on our website. Um, they came up with 22 case studies which explore people's approaches to digital engagement, the lessons learned, so what they should have done, what they could have done better, and motivations for participating. And it's just the motivation section that I'd like to very briefly focus on right now. So we know that people often are motivated to engage by taking part in some sort of challenge and getting some sort of reward particularly useful when you're engaging young people um, who want to prove that they've learned something to move on to the next step. Uh, the opportunity to make a difference and contribute to something wider, so going in and seeing that this picture is relative to where you lived or is about an area where you know and being able to post something that helps that body of knowledge and helps people's wider understanding. Uh, digital experiences that connect with activities in the real world, so actually archaeology on the ground, opportunities to engage on the ground but also uh, in the digital sphere, and interaction, customization and sharing. And looking at how people will benefit throughout your project and afterwards. Um, I won't go into all of these listed here. But there are lots of ways that people can gain from engaging with heritage through digital technology. And this could include everything from learning about the heritage and discovering the hidden stories and features in familiar places to satisfaction of making a difference. And there are some things that may enhance people's experiences of heritage and help ensure audiences benefit as much as possible. So providing ways in which the audience can connect with experts like curators and archivists as well as each other and there's a lot of this going on at the moment where you can go onto a website, click and you hear a soundbite from that expert about whatever that object is. Ensuring different levels of engagement as I mentioned earlier can also encourage and motivate the audience to learn more. Uh, whether their priority, whether they have previous knowledge or experience. So not just directing it at an audience that is bound to know the subject matter, but also making sure that there's an entry level for people who may have an interest but don't have that prior knowledge. And if asking people to contribute, there needs to be some clarity about how their work or their material will be used and acknowledged. Does the applicant have the resources to manage this? And making sure that it's really clear up front how that work will be um, used. And finally, just to mention not to underestimate the pleasure for people of being able to see their own work become part of a wider record that is available for everyone to see. I mean, we fund hundreds of projects that involve volunteers. And just them being able to take part in something and then celebrate that achievement is a huge thing. So we encourage that as much as possible. And fund it. Okay, so finally, I just want to talk about the issues of engaging people digitally. Some of the issues that Heritage Lottery Fund, we think, um, need to be flagged up and, and shared more widely. So digital activity requires a much more open way of working. And organisations should not expect to control every aspect of the user experience 
or the destiny of their digital data. So we encourage people to be more open and not protective with content, which encourages people to participate. Now obviously you need to think of quality um, and making sure that information is correct that is added onto a site or that it's added to a body of knowledge. But that can happen through using volunteers and, get, and skilling people up to be able to deliver that. Taking advantage of digital environments that target audiences already um, in habit makes sense, such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. However, it's still important to understand that audience and social media, as I mentioned, is particularly effective to 18 to 35, but the message still needs to be targeted with content written specifically for that group. And we still require a marketing strategy of some sort that's needed to show how we will target those audiences and make people aware of that digital activity. It might require the traditional methods of marketing, such as local media or print material, as well as digital or online forums. But if trying to attract new audiences, outreach and partnership work in, it will still be important to do this. So we're not looking to see a separate marketing strategy for digital engagement, but we are looking to see it as part of the overall picture, so it becomes uh, core, if you like, to the, the project. Okay, well that's just some of the information that we wanted to share in terms of the lessons that we're learning and what we're looking for with regards to digital activity. Um, it's worth saying that we have got guidance on our website which is available on the webpage that, that Bob mentioned earlier, www.hlf.org.uk. Uh, the case studies document is up there as well. Um, unfortunately, I have to leave at lunchtime, but um, I'm very interested to hear about what other projects are doing, and particularly around the evaluation of digital engagement. So, thank you very much. <laughs>